Well, welcome. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome my friend and colleague Mark Blythe from Brown University to speak to us today. Uh, one of my favorite Mark Blythe stories is one he tells on himself in the beginning of his fabulous book, uh, Great Transformations, where he talks about sitting, I think, in a car with his father, who had been a butcher, and, um, and they were talking about economic ideas in Thatcher's UK, where Mark grew up, uh, from Scotland. And um, the, the great thing about the story was sort of the confusion between Mark and his father over what ought to be done in the British economy at a time when it wasn't performing well. And Mark had one set of ideas, and his dad had another set of ideas. And that resonated so deeply with me, because I come from a family that has a good number of crazy economic ideas, to which they subscribe as articles of faith. And, and whenever we talk about economic policy, there's sort of a, 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 di it's a dialogue of the deaf in some ways. And, and I think that one of the reasons that um, people are attracted to certain economic ideas is just because of the simplicity and beauty of the ideas, the parsimony, as we say, that they really sort of, they, they get right to the point quickly and efficiently. And one of the great things about Mark's book is the way that he shows how important this is for the success of an economic, uh, an economic idea, that people can understand it and can begin to hum the tune a little bit. Um, a lot of his work has tried to explain how and why certain ideas succeed where other ideas that might have been just as plausible or even more plausible fail. And I think it's a very, very powerful, important message that he sends out. Uh, author of a number of books, a handbook of international political economy, Beyond the Great Transformations book that I've already mentioned, teaches at Brown University where he's closely associated with the Watson Center for International Studies, which appears to consume an inordinate amount of his time these days. Gave a, a fascinating paper in the poli-sci department today on the current economic crisis. And I've asked him today to, um, uh, to sort of tell undergraduate students what they know about the situation that we're in right now. And as you can tell from the title of his talk, uh, his uh, worry is that we are, in fact, not yet out of the woods. And I'm very happy to introduce Mark and have him explain why he thinks that. So please join me in welcoming Mark Blythe to BYU. So as Wade explained, I'm from Scotland. Um, as you can hear from this accent, which uh, is actually the, exactly the same as Shrek. <laughs> I will prove this to you with one word, donkey. <laughs> now, how weird is this? Because basically, I am actually Scottish, and the guy who did this, Mike Myers, is not. And I spent 20 years in the United States. I didn't originally sound like this. This is what happens when you live in the United States for 20 years. And eventually, I end up sounding like a fictional character that he made up a makeup voice for. Something very strange going on. I study nonlinearities. That's an example of one of them. Anyway, further on to this. Uh, the crisis. It's an interesting thing. There's an idea now that uh, essentially we're out of it, or rather it's changed. So we had the financial crisis here in 2008, and then the Europeans have got into trouble because they spent all this money, and they now have this big sovereign debt crisis, right? And that's it. And then, oh, yeah, there's China over there. So I'm going to tell you the story that tries to link them all together. Because it's actually the same crisis. It actually hasn't changed. It hasn't gone away. It's still linked together. And although the American economy is actually remarkably resilient and recovering far better than the Europeans for reasons I'll be happy to go into, there's this whole fascination we have with China and the rise of China, etc. And I want to make that part of the story because I think there's something non-obvious and interesting going on there as well. So anyway, on with the slides as they do. So it ain't over until what? The fat lady sings, that's exactly correct. Now, what's the fat lady singing in this course? Well, here's the crisis. And the problem with the crisis is it's overdetermined and overexplained. And what do I mean by this? It's a guy called Justin Lin who runs the MIT Finance Lab. And he just did a piece in one of the big economics journals where he randomly sampled 21 books on the financial crisis, sat down and read them. I don't know where he found the time. And he found out that no one can agree on what caused it. Now, on the one hand, you could say that's a terrible failure for all these academics that are meant to figure things out, or it could just be that the world is astonishingly complex. That is, lots and lots of different things push in the same direction. So let's run through a few of them, right? Well, we all know it was something about subprime mortgages, right? So there's Fannie and Freddie and giving people who can't afford houses, houses and all that. And that's popular, particularly amongst people with sort of right-wing politics, right? Well, there's another one, complex instruments, derivatives. So the CDS, CDU, all that sort of stuff, all that bad technical stuff. And that's kind of popular with academics because it shows, them that they, it shows people they can be very clever because they understand all these complex technical things that normal people don't. So 
that gives them a bit of a premium. Another one, excessive leverage. That's a fancy way of saying there's too much debt. Right? Now, leverage is also a technical thing inside banks. It's about how you structure your balance sheet and so on. And this is popular amongst regulators because it gives them something to do. So if the cause is excessive leverage, then you give regulators the room to regulate leverage. It gives them something to do. So they like that one. Uh, <clears throat> you'll notice a lot of the aftermath of the crisis is exposed, and I'm going to show you some slides on this, that uh, large parts of America haven't been doing so well if you take away the supply of credit over the past decade. And those of a left-wing persuasion kind of like that one, because it basically says there's something bad going on and capitalism's evil or something like this. Then is the Greenspan put, the idea that Alan Greenspan, when he was uh, running things, essentially kept interest rates too low for too long. And this became effectively asset protection for banks, which is to say they could buy something and hold it even if they thought it was a bad investment because at the end of the day, if things went bad, there'd be super cheap money lying around because Alan would never raise interest rates. And given the fact that Alan Greenspan looks like Yoda, it was easy to blame him for everything. And the fact, and he does, if you put them side by side on a slide, it's really weird. And the other one, of course, is you know that bankers are greedy. Well, bankers have always been greedy. So you can't explain variation with a constant. And the crisis seems to be with us in a new form. Here's the National Bank of Greece, now written as the National Bank of Berlin. This obviously speaks to the Euro crisis. And then we have the 99%, 1% Occupy movement here in the United States. So this thing that began with mortgages and all this stuff has spilled out into basically riots of huge proportion in Greece and the impoverishment of millions of people in the European periphery and the whole sort of strum and drang, if you will, of the Occupy movement. So I'm going to try and put all this together with a metaphor. And the metaphor is, imagine the global economy as a subprime CDO. So what? Okay, so here's the whole idea that got us into trouble. How many of your parents have mortgages? Lots. There are lots of people in the United States who have lots of mortgages. In fact, there are more mortgages in the United States than there are people, for reasons I can explain if you really want me to. But nonetheless, most of them are tied to houses. Most of them get paid. Most of them are really safe bets. When you have this, the phrase as safe as houses, you're talking about the income stream attached to a mortgage. And it used to be the case that bankers knew the people they were giving the money to because they had a credit history with them. So there was an idea you have this asset called a house, and that's really safe. So how could we juice the returns and make it more safe? Well, imagine if we had a phenomena called uncorrelated assets. What does that mean? Well, in New York, imagine the New York economy goes bad. Uh -huh. well, that means there'll be more people in New York who can't pay back their mortgage, right? Okay, fine, I'm with you. How is that going to affect Baltimore? Nope. Is that going to affect Utah? Nope. So if we took mortgages from Utah and Baltimore and Miami and different places and kind of pooled them all together, then that would, in a sense, make things that are already uncorrelated even less correlated. Yes, it would. OK, I've got a really good idea. Imagine we put all these different mortgages with all these different risk premia together, and then what we'll do is slice them up according to how much risk you're willing to hold. So let's say that you really want lots of yield. You're in it for the money, and you can afford to take a loss. What are you going to buy? You're going to buy, let's say, big glass condos in Baltimore because there's a bit of a risk involved there. But let's say you're a pension fund. You've got long-term liabilities, and you're willing to wait for the long term. What are you going to do? Well, let's say houses belonging to high school teachers in Utah. They're going to pay back. There may be a slightly higher default rate than the average because they don't get paid too much, and the asset doesn't increase in value because it's not in a coastal city. But that's a pretty safe bet. But let's say you really want to be safe. What about Manhattan penthouses? You can bet that they always get paid back. So the idea was, by creating these different tranches with different risk premium associated to them, you can buy the risky asset you want. But at the same time, it doesn't affect anyone else because all this stuff's uncorrelated, right? Now, how on earth does this work with the global economy? Well, imagine that the equity tranche, the riskiest bit, is the United States. Imagine that the mezzanine tranche, the next less risky bit, is Europe. And who's the bit of the global economy now that's regarded as the one that's growing the fastest and has all those cash reserves and trillions of dollars of T-bills? China. Explanation by metaphor. Let's see how it works. So here's the equity tranche, the United States. Great picture, isn't it? So we had a housing bubble. It's a big one. So imagine, actually, let me use my laser. Is, my, is this my laser? Yes, my, where's my laser? Oh, I killed it. 
How did I get it back? They fix it? I, honestly, given a Scotsman technology, it's a really bad idea. <laughs> can, I, can I please get this back? Hello? What do you do? All I wanted was the laser. Is it too much to ask for the laser? All right, I'm going to continue anyway, right? Can you still see this? Right, okay, right, fine. There's my laser, look. So basically, if you follow the green line, this is the trend rate of growth of GDP, right? Basically, it's meant to just track, oh, oh yay, yes, almost. Thank you, Microsoft, I promise I won't do it again. Hey, all right, great, don't ever do that again. Press one and one, that's it, right. So this is the trend rate of growth of GDP. It goes up at about 2 to 3% a year. Well, look what happened starting in about 2000. Way beyond this. Now, this is a classic bubble. Up, a little bit of a respite, and then down to the bottom. Market bottom, 2009, maybe yes, maybe no. When the housing bubble burst, all of those mortgages, the risky ones, the subprime stuff, all this sort of stuff, this impacts the real economy. Now, why does it impact the real economy? What's it got to do with anything with us? Well, basically, all those banks are using those assets to trade with each other. And the world wants to hold lots of assets which are high value, triple A rated, and give you a positive return. But if you get freaked out about holding an asset and you don't think it's worth what it says on the book anymore, what do you do? You dump it on the market. What happens if everybody dumps it on the market all at once? You can't find a price for it. It falls through the floor. So suddenly your banks are underwater because they're heavily levered. That means that for every dollar they have in reverse, they have $30 out there in the world playing, trying to make yield. So all you need is a 3% return turn against your assets and your bank is underwater. If your bank's underwater, they stop lending to everyone else. And that immediately impacts the real economy. That's why they called it a liquidity crunch. So what you see here is a decade of returns in the stock market wiped out. Now, why has it gone back up here? I'd be happy to get to that in the Q&A because if you think about it, it's weird. Every other economic indicator is flat and the stock market's going up. Bit strange. Now, why did this happen? Because of this thing called a liquidity crunch. This is what happens when banks freak out and stop lending to each other. So what you have here, you can just see it, is the premium that you pay on what are called credit default swaps, these evil technical instruments. They're basically insurance policies. So if you don't think something, a very remote thing's gonna happen, what's the odds on Lehman Brothers going bust? You're like, forget about it, that'll never happen. Great, I'll write a contract insuring anything that you've got that's Lehman, and you give me a premium, just like an insurance policy back. So usually, CDS prices are very, very low. Then people start to get nervous. Then Lehman goes bust. Then we bail them, or rather we let them fail and we start to bail the system, but still, basically, the price that you pay is very, very high for any type of credit protection. So this is why you get this real economy crunch. Now, next. There we go. Here's what I see when the real economy contracts. Everything's jumping around nice, averaging two to four to five percent, and then bang, that's the big contraction. This is what generates the next slide, which is unemployment. Now, here's the one you get on the news. Here's the fun one. The United States is unique amongst developed nations in the way that it calculates unemployment. Because what you do to find out the unemployment rate in the United States is the most insane thing I can possibly think of. You phone up three and a half thousand people in the middle of the afternoon and ask them if they have a job. In the one country where if you don't have a job, you are seen as someone less than normal. Do you think there might be a bias in the under-reporting if you're going to do that? So what you do instead is you look at a measure that looks at all the people that were on W-2s, they were paying taxes, they came off payroll, and they didn't show up on payroll again, but they were on benefit at one point. If you do that, you get the U-6 measure. That's currently sitting at 15%. That's the real effective unemployment rate of the United States. This has hurt, but it's hurt certain people more than others. Is it going to go? I hate clickers. Come on, there we go. Right, all of which are rather different in America. One made up of falling savings and debt-driven consumption. Remember that bit where the real economy fell off a cliff? Here you're looking at personal consumption expenditures. This is basically how much we're spending. So we're having a rare old time. Here's personal savings. Look what happens to savings. Down at 6%, 5%, 4%, 3%. By the, just before the housing bubble burst, we were taking so much money out of our houses, we gave up on saving. 
We actually had a negative savings rate. The United States has always had a positive savings rate. And yet we're still consuming. Look, at the same time we're not saving, we're consuming. So where's the money coming from? Well, if you start using your house as an ATM with home equity loans, if you start taking returns out of the stock market, which is super inflated, that's what's going to happen. What is this actually masking? Something else that's been going on, rising income inequality. This is the 99%, 1% claim. Here is what's happened to the income of the 99%. It's flat. Here is what's happened to the income of the 1%. It's gone up quite considerably. And so long as everyone else has access to credit, that doesn't matter. So what happens if you have a credit crunch? There's a nice phrase for this. You figure out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. So falling income is also, at the same time, rising poverty. Here's median US household income. Falling from 52,000 down to 50,000, uh, 50, up again and back down again. This is over a decade, so basically it's been stagnant at best. Here's what's happened to the number of Americans living in poverty. 46.2 million in a population of 300, 000, 300 million. That's astonishing in the richest country in the world. What masks that? Why were we not aware of that? because of the availability of credit. It made it look a lot better than it was. So when the credit bubble pops, suddenly you see a very different world. I hate this clicker. <laughs> Click. Thank you, right. And this is true for everybody except the financial sector. Here's a wonderful slide. So if you look on the bottom here, here you have 1910, 1920, all the way through to 2010. Here's incomes as multiples of the median income in the financial sector. So guess what? You make a lot of money until basically you have the Great Depression and the Wall Street crash, and then you fall to still higher than the median income. But look what happens beginning in 1980. Bang. Through the floor, or through the roof, I should say. Now, this gets interesting for the politics, because, of course, if you have to bail all these banks out, and we did have to bail all the banks out, bad news, I had to tell you this, here's why. How many people live in the United States? 300,000, right? 300 million. What's the uh, working population? How many Americans get up every day and actually work and register and get a W-2? 158 million. How many handguns are there in the United States? 55 million. What would happen if there was no money in the ATMs? Because 72% of Americans have no savings and live paycheck to paycheck. So if you didn't bail all the banks and there was no money in the ATMs and you couldn't buy groceries and you couldn't, couldn't put gas in the car and you couldn't take yourself to work and you couldn't put the kids in school, what do you think would happen before the handguns started coming out? So unfortunately, you had to do it. And when you did it, you discovered how much it cost, which is this line. So this is how much your budget's in balance, which actually last happened under Bill Clinton for like two seconds. And then this is the all after 9-11, then the recovery, and then the cost of bailing the banks around 9 to 10% of GDP globally. What happens? You get the Tea Party. Because the one thing that these guys know is the puts on them. They understand that ultimately when you bail Wall Street, you're actually taking the money to do so out of the pockets of Main Street. It's got to come from somewhere and you've got to pay it back. So they look at that increase in debt and quite reasonably, in my opinion, say, hang on a minute, I'm a normal Joe. Why am I bailing out Wall Street? Well, you can run through the argument that, you know, handguns, 55 million, it's all going to end badly. But they still know the puts on them. Because they're terrified of future inflation. Here's the American money supply. Relatively constant-ish. Bang. Now, if you believe that an increase in money has to be met by an increase in goods, otherwise it's inflationary, standard econ 101, then that's something to be worried about. And of course, this is the net cost of then bailing those banks. Here's the average public debt of the advanced economies. The opposite of the fiscal balance goes up to 100% in most cases. Now, this results in this nonsense. America is drowning in debt. Now, I say it's nonsense, having been quite sympathetic about it for a moment, because of this reason. American debt is actually quite moderate. Have a look at this. So here's the US. Here's government debt. Let's have a look at Japanese government debt, shall we? Does anyone think Japan's going to go bankrupt anytime soon? The Japanese 10-year bond trades at 0.9%. Ours trades at about 1.8. So they have three times the debt, and yet none of that seems to matter. If I were a country and I wanted to be worried, I'd be really worried about Britain. Look at financial institution debt. That's how much debt's in their banks. Now look at their households. Non-financial institution. 
and they're worried about government debt. David Cameron's cutting the government debt. That's the one part that they shouldn't be worried about. So look at Germany, that paragon of fiscal austerity and virtue. It's basically the same level of debt as the United States. So why are we panicking about this? Well, remember that Tea Party politics? It meant that we got gridlock. And because we got gridlock and the Democrats want to do one thing, the Republicans want to do something else, it meant that the only guy who could do anything was Ben Bernanke. And Ben Bernanke went to the banks and said, you know all these really crappy mortgages you've got on your books? Give me them, and I'll give you some money back instead. And then what you can do is start the real economy again, get over the credit crunch. So the Federal Reserve came what's known as a bad bank. Basically, here's its normal liquidity operations, and then here's all the special programs it starts to do. And this is billions of dollars, thousands of billions of dollars, to soak up all the bad assets in the banks. And this is what they're called. It's all very transparent. So Maiden Lane 3 LLC. Anyone know what that is? I don't think anyone knows what that is. Nonetheless, it costs you about $40 billion. Given the politics, it stays that way. So the Federal Reserve has become a global bad bank because what we also found out was a lot of these mortgages and a lot of these banks that were taking money from the Fed weren't even American. Because you've got this thing called broker-dealer licenses, which means that you can be a big bank and do lots of things very cheaply in New York. 14 of the broker-dealer licenses belong to European banks. This is why Europe starts to get into trouble. And we'll get there very shortly. So anyway, the Federal Reserve is basically the only thing that can do anything, which is why Ben Bernanke's got all these crappy mortgages sitting in the Federal Reserve. Which brings me to Europe. Europe is not in great fiscal health. Let's have a look. Here's the US. We're worried about our debt levels. Let's have a look at Ireland. There's Japan again. Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal. What do you call that? The pigs of Europe. So they already start off with a much higher load of debt. Now, the weird thing is, is the perception of debt. Before the euro came in in 1999, Italian debt to GDP was 121%. Nobody cared. Today, when we're freaking out about Italian debt, it's 119%. Everybody cares. So what's happened? It's the perception of the debt rather than the sheer amount. But it's true that they definitely carry more debt. Now, where does this come from? Current account imbalances. Big squiggly lines. Here's the really important one. The red one is Germany. Germany is the biggest economy. How many of you or your parents drive a German car? Surprisingly few. I thought they were very popular. They're on their way to become, Volkswagen's on its way to becoming the biggest uh, automaker in the world. They basically sell globally, they make high quality products. Germans talk about Deutsche Qualität, right? You make things that last, that's why if you buy a Miele washing machine, it's three times as expensive as anything else, all the rest of it. They're an export powerhouse. The problem was, when you join everything together in one currency, that makes the Germans more competitive and they already make really good stuff. So what happens? They start to export like mad. Unfortunately, countries like Greece and others don't really have anything to export. So they start to export less. Why? Because the Germans are giving them free money. What? Why would the Germans be giving them free money? Watch this. You've got lax public finances, which is to say you're not bringing in as much taxes as you can, there's lots of loopholes, so you end up generating lots of deficits. So what have you got here? Annual growth of government expenditure. So the Irish are growing their government, how much the government spends on social programs and everything at 10%. Spain's doing 7%, Greece is doing nearly 7%, Portugal again, all this excessive expenditure. Germany, the one who's actually making the money, they're not spending. So how can they spend money they don't have? Well, part of this is about wages. Follow me on this, it all makes sense. What has this got to do with wages? Well, think of Ireland again. Ireland, over this period, seven years, gave itself a 30, near 30% 30 wage increase. How the hell did it do that? We established that Greece doesn't make anything. They've given themselves a 20% wage increase. Where are they getting the money from? Well, if you go back here to this one, notice that here there's an interesting date, 2000. At 2000, everybody except the French stops exporting. What happens in 2000, 2001? The euro comes in. And when the euro comes in, it makes the Germans artificially cheap, and it makes everybody else artificially dear in terms of what they can export. And that's why you start to see all this stuff. Now, the clincher on this is I'm married to a German, right? That's not the clincher. But I have a German father-in-law. And he has a phrase, he says, if you have two marks, you spend one. Very German. Now, he says, how come my banks ended up in trouble in Greece? Because, you know, I didn't buy Greek bonds. And the answer is, yeah, you didn't, but your banks did. 
Because when the euro came in, what's called the yield curve collapsed. So all the differences in risk pricing between buying Greek bonds and nice, safe German bonds disappeared. So all the big core banks in the Netherlands and France, and particularly in Germany, decided, hey, why are we carrying around all this, Greek, uh, all this safe German stuff? Let's buy Greek stuff. There's still a slight spread. If we buy lots and lots of it, we'll make lots of money. So they did. So they dump all the safe debt, buy all the crap debt. Now, if I'm buying a huge, if I'm a huge country like Germany, I'm buying lots and lots of Greek debt. What's happening is essentially I'm giving the Greeks my money to spend. What do they spend it on? BMWs. Why are the Germans running a surplus? Because they gave them the money to buy the stuff from them. That was the bit that nobody saw coming in the Euro. It was meant to make the lower countries more competitive and the top countries less. It had the exact opposite effect. Because when buying their bonds, you gave them free money to buy good stuff. Who makes the good stuff? The Germans, not the Greeks. Bit of a problem. So, what this means is all the core banks in France and Germany and these places are filled with crappy assets. Have you heard that before? Did that happen to a place called America? Yes, only this time you've got a problem because you don't have a Ben Bernanke in Europe who's going to take all those crappy mortgages and stuff them in a place called the Federal Reserve and hope the problem goes away. You have a thing called the European Central Bank, which is a fake central bank. Why is it a fake central bank? Because it has no lender of last resort function. So what you have is 30% of French GDP tied up in crappy assets on their bank's balance sheets. You have the same in the Netherlands. You have 25% in Portugal. You have 20% in Germany. This is the UK. Now, these are 2009 fourth quarter data, so they've shoved this down a little bit. But nonetheless, you still have literally a trillion dollars in bad debt sitting in the core banks in Germany and France. Why do you think the Germans won't let the Greeks go? Because if they do and they default on their debt, that's what it's going to cost them. This isn't a sovereign debt crisis. It's a banking crisis. The same thing that happened to America with crappy mortgages is now happening not with crappy mortgages, but with crappy government bonds that seem to be artificially cheap because the euro gave banks an incentive to dump the safe debt and build up all of the bad debt from the periphery, which allowed the periphery to overconsume. So when the Germans are shouting down the phone at the Greeks saying, you guys have spent too much, the, German, the Greeks can quite rightly turn around and say, yes, and you gave us the money, you idiot. What did you expect us to do with it? We bought BMWs. Fun, isn't it? So you end up with the euro, which is great politics, but lousy economics. No real lender of last resort. There's no Ben Bernanke to just turn on the money taps. No unified bond market, so you have the problem of worrying about if the Greeks default, then the Portuguese default, and if the Portuguese default, then the Irish default, and everybody goes crazy. You can't bail out your own banks. Why? Because you don't run the currency. The currency is run by these guys in Frankfurt. So if French banks get into trouble, the French government can't print any money. The reason that Britain looks good these days is because it still has its own bank. It can print money to bail its banks. The European banks can't do this. And at the end of the day, you've still got political parties who are responsible to those electorates. Those electorates are national. And the Germans don't want to give the Greeks any more money. So you've got to have a problem. The austerity problem. What is the austerity problem? Well, we can't all basically save at once. Somebody has to be spending for somebody to be belt tightening. We can't all make BMWs. And there's no way that we can all tighten our pants when everybody's wearing different pants. Which is to say, if I'm a rich country, I can afford to cut more. But if I'm a poor country and I'm being asked to cut the same amount, it cuts much deeper. And it makes it almost impossible to get out of debt. So giving the Greeks more money won't do anything other than kick the can down the road. They don't have any assets to grow back with. Now, here's the proof of this. Here's a couple of the pigs. This is Portugal, Greece, and Ireland. They've all been doing austerity, pro uh, austerity policies for the past uh, two and a half years. Here's where they started off in terms of debt. It's gone up in every single case. They've generated more debt by cutting things rather than you would expect they would have less debt at the end of it. Why? Because your unemployment's going up. As your unemployment goes up, you pay more benefits. When you pay more benefits, people consume less because it's less than your wages. Consumption goes down, so you can't tax people. So your tax receipts go down at the same time as your deficits go up. So you end up with more debt rather than less. It's a fallacy of composition. What's rational for any one country or person to do is nuts if we all try it because there's no one buying anything.
which is why the American economy is recovering and the European economy is going from bad to worse. Now, how did all this public private mortgage debt become European sovereign debt? Very simple one, bailing out the banks. Here's the costs globally of bailing out the banks. You know the stimulus, the thing that drives the Tea Party mad? is 12% of all spending. Over ha almost half of it is revenue loss. But between 2000 and 2007, 40% of corporate taxes were coming out of the financial sector in the US. So when those taxes dry up, what happens to the deficit? It explodes. So how do you plug that deficit? You can either shut down the federal government, including the armed services, or you can issue bonds. That's where the debt comes from. So most of it isn't stimulus problems. It's actually increasing interest payments and plugging fiscal gaps. The other part of it is European banks. This is the scary bit. So when the euro comes in, suddenly everybody's an international bank. You can be whatever bank from Portugal. You now trade in euros. So you don't have to play in your local market anymore. You can go global. So they did. They went to America and they bought every piece of subprime garbage they could find. Here's how it worked. European banks sit outside of the standard US sector. So US households give money to their banking sector that gives it to US borrowers. Very simple. Europeans sit inside of this, but they have those broker-dealer licenses. This gives them access to what's called the wholesale funding market. They're able to go to the very short-term money markets, borrow overnight at 0%, almost, and then lend it to their customers in Europe for 30 years at a positive carry. So you're borrowing overnight to fund 30 years. You're making a 30-year bet in the future that nothing will change. Do you think you'll be different in 30 years? I think you'll be different in 30 years. This was insanity as a business model. But it kept working, so they kept doing it. On the other side, seeing as they were getting free money from the Americans, they might as well use it to buy the stuff the Americans were making, which is called asset-backed commercial paper, otherwise known as crappy mortgages. Eurobanks are now cut off from those short-term funding markets, which is why they now have their only source of liquidity come to the European Central Bank. 70% of the what are called the SIVs, the special investment vehicles that were trading mortgages, turned out to be European. They weren't American at all. Eurobanks have periphery debt is what's called their tier one capital. That's their cushion for when it all goes wrong, Greek bonds. And the Eurobanks are basically on life support from what's called the long-term liquidity operations of the ECB. So they're not looking too well. Let's go to the super senior tranche, China. China's going to save us, right? OK, let's go. First of all, here's the assets and liabilities of the Chinese balance sheet. First one, 3.4 trillion in US cut debt in cash. Well, let's think about this for a minute. People tell me that the Chinese economy is more robust than the, Euro than the American economy. Their major asset is American paper. Therefore, the Chinese economy is only as good as American paper. So let's think about that one. We've been on the best scam forever. For the past 20 years, we've been, the Chinese have been giving us televisions, and we've been giving them paper that bears 2% in a positive inflationary environment. I mean, we think this is bad. This is the best deal we've ever done. It's true, the economy is growing at 10%. It's the second largest economy in the world, and 400 million people have been brought out of poverty in 20 years. But let's think about the li liability side of this. The EU and the US is 70% consumption-driven. That's where all their exports go. Only 38% of the Chinese economy, 35%, is actually consumption. They can't consume what they make. We need to buy it. 38% national savings. We're at 2.5. That's a lot of saving. Where does all that savings go? not into domestic consumption. They're 40% dependent on exports going somewhere else. They have a huge domestic housing bubble. Why? Because they don't trust their own banks. So what do they do? They buy real things. Well, if your economy is growing at 10% a year and you've got a lot of foreign exchange lying around, you put it in real assets. They have whole cities with no one in them. I'm not making this up. You can go online, look at it on YouTube. It's amazing. They've built 100 million apartments in 10 years. Hardly anyone lives in them. They're all real estate hedges. Large-scale domestic unrest, a huge inequality coefficient. Whoops, sorry, go back one. The Gini coefficient, 0.47. This is the same as the US, but the US has a safety net. There is no safety net in China. So a nice way of thinking about China is if you're in Shanghai, you're in Belgium in terms of inequality. If you go 50 miles outside, Bel uh, outside of uh, Shanghai, you're in Zimbabwe in terms of inequality. And if people aren't consuming enough, then what are the Chinese going to do with all those exports? Because at the end of the day, when you add together the EU and the US, it's 70% of global consumption. China's 10%. So is China going to save us? Probably well, not the case. What's going to happen instead? Well, think about it simply. 
if you're 10%, 20% in the world economy even, and your 70% isn't consuming, there's nowhere for China's exports to go. If China's major asset is US T-bills, then it's only as good as the value of the T-bill. So China can't bail us. So just like that old subprime thing, the super senior isn't isolated, it's correlated. Same with the mezzanine, same with the equity. It's all part of the one story. It starts off with American banks, it goes to European banks, and it's ending up in the balance sheet of China in the weird form of, guess what, a housing bubble. How did all that start here? A housing bubble. So what could happen? Well, you could get some obvious triggers. European sadomonetarism, as I like to call it, everybody trying to slash themselves to growth. Doesn't work when you all do it at once. One of the pigs defaults, or you get what's called CDO contagion, we can talk about that. A large euro bank collapses, or the CDS market collapses, and all the yields go up. So the global economy looks like a big subtime CDO. The junior has infected the mezzanine. The senior tranche is not secure. Take home result, the crisis begins and ends with the banks. The sovereign debt crisis is transmuted to banking crisis, but for some reason we still beat up on sovereigns. It really has nothing to do with states. A nice way to think about it is the following. Imagine your house is on fire and someone ran out of the house and they had a big, um, a big tin of kerosene, only it was called mortgages. And they bumped into you and you're the fireman. And you say, I'll have that, sit there, and you take it and you put it down, you run it in the house and you basically put it all out and all the rest of it. Well, you'd think what would happen is the guy with the matches and the mortgages would go to jail, but we don't do it that way. In fact, what we do is we blame the firemen. We say that we shouldn't have been involved in the market. We say that the uh, government has bailed out the banks and that's the problem, which is true, and it is a problem because we've got all this debt now, but really what was the alternative? Let the house burn down? And at the end of the day, this starts with banks. It's still about banks in Europe. And at the end of the day, China doesn't have a banking system that can bail us. So it's the same prices. Hasn't gone away. Still with us. You've got all that to look forward to. I'm a very happy person. Thank you very much. I think that's the end, isn't it? Yeah, it is. There you are. That's it. There you go. That's the end. That took slightly longer than I anticipated. Sorry about that. I'm Lindy. I'm studying social sciences teaching. Um, you mentioned earlier that everything else in the economy is flatlining, but the stock market is going up. Could you briefly explain that? Yeah, it's, it's actually re really simple. There's nowhere else to put your money. <laughs> it's really that simple, if you think about it. So if you're a small investor, right? You could take it to a local bank, and they will give you 0.5% interest for a year in a positive inflation environment, so they're just ripping your money off. You can put it in a T-bill, which will give you the rate of inflation. You could put it in European equities. You could put it in China. Or you can stick it in the stock market, because at least that's real. And that's pretty much what's happening. It's the last refuge. There's nowhere else to put your money. Now, if enough money pushes into a market, it's a simple demand and supply thing. If you have more demand than available supply, what happens to price? Econ 101, folks. That's it. Um, I'm Emily Kim. I'm studying history teaching. And you mentioned that Ben Bernanke uh, the Federal Reserve bought all of the bad mortgages to try to kickstart the economy. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to be effective? It would be effective if we could actually clear the mortgages that remain on the bank's balance sheets off the bank's balance sheets. Here's the, here's the really simple way to think about it. If you've got bad assets on one side of your balance sheet, the ledger of what the bank's got, you have to think about how banks work. Banks work very differently from normal people. For you, an asset would be money in your pocket. For a bank, an asset is money that's out being loaned. It's the other way around. So the more debt that they're in, the more they count it as an asset. I know it sounds weird, but that's how balance sheet double accounting actually works. So what does this mean? It means that the assets that they've got out there as loans need to be reduced to a price that will actually sell. And the problem is to do that, you need to take a massive hit on the mortgages that are the remaining there. So obviously, if you do that, you're going to drive these banks to the brink of insolvency. Citibank is basically insolvent. It's true, right? And how do we stop this? Because if they collapse, it'd be terrible. Well, you have to get growth going in the economy again. So how do you get growth going again? You, well, you get lending going, and you give it to companies and entrepreneurs, and they set things up and all the rest of it. Yeah, but I can't do that. Why? Because I'm a bank, and I'm stuck with all these crappy mortgages. 
So what do I do? I give them to Mr. Bernanke and he gives me a pile of cash. I'm then meant to lend, but I don't. Banks are now sitting on more cash. Companies are sitting on more cash than at any time in American history. Now, why are they all sitting there with cash? Because they're afraid. They don't want to put it out there. And if we're individually afraid, that doesn't matter. But if we're collectively afraid, what happens? Nobody invests. And if nobody invests, you bring about the very outcome you're afraid of. So that's where we are. We're stuck. So Bernanke shouldn't have done it. Congress should have had the, the responsibility of taking care of it, but they couldn't agree on anything. Bernanke takes the mortgages away, leaves some, throws some cash at them and says, get going. And the banks go, no, thanks, we won't bother. And that's pretty much where we are. The European story is exactly the same. Matt Hubbard, I'm studying econ. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is uh, what your uh, Greg Smith, Goldman Sachs, he uh, had an article yesterday and then kind of was blown up today. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. And I guess the second question is these banks, they have prop trading desk where they're trading their own capital. Um, do you think the new Basel regulations are going to be effective? Because, um, I mean, now the banks, they're coming more like court. Commercial banks. Yeah, commercial banks. Right. And so I just kind of hear your thoughts on that because it seems like the banking system's really, there's some imperfections in the foundation, yeah. in that market. It's really the problem. And what, what, mm -hmm. what could we do to fix that? Uh, the, on the first one, on the, the guy who wrote the op ed, et cetera, right? You know, so banker resigns in disgust is, you know, a bit sort of like war criminal goes to Hague and finds out he's going to be prosecuted. Shock. You know, so I'll just put that to one side. Um, the interesting one, and there's a longer version of this talk and a different version of this talk, actually talks about the real problem here. And the real problem behind the whole thing is the business model of investment banking's bust. Right? That's really the problem. So what do I mean by this? How do banks make money? Banks make money by sitting in the middle of a trade. Right? So you're, you've got excess money. You need money. I hook you up. That's basically what I do. And then I take a cut. That's classic banking, right? Now, in the 60s and 70s, they used to call this 363 banking. You borrowed at three, you lent at six, you were on the golf course for three. It was very straightforward and very boring. You ever seen Mad Men? That was the world. Actually, in Mad Men, there's an episode where they start complaining about how high income taxes were. Because under Eisenhower, they were 87% of the top marginal rate. Think about that. And he was a Republican, right? So very, very different world for banking, right? Now, what happened in the 1980s with deregulation and all this stuff was that banks got to do whatever the hell they wanted. And then had a bunch of people called economists who also told them that whatever they did was good. So that was a bit of a conflict of interest problem, but there we go. So anyway, they start to do whatever they want. They start to invent all these interesting instruments and stuff and lever up. Well, what does that mean? They take on a head load, an awful lot of debt. Why do you want to do this? Right? Imagine the following. Imagine I know that a stock's going to go up by 10%. I can take my actual cash and I can buy the stock and wait for the appreciation. Or I can buy what's called an options contract, which costs me 10 cents to buy those stocks at a certain time for a certain price, because somebody on the other side of the trade is willing to bet that those stocks aren't willing to go up. So you can invent a market in what's called derivatives. And if that 10% gain is amplified by taking on 100 times debt, that one trade can make me a billion dollars. You can't do that in an era of 363 banking, but you can now. If you want to do that, however, you don't need customers. Customers don't have enough money. What you need are other banks. You need counterparties. So you get rid of customers, you get counterparties instead. Big banks doing lots of trade. You do what's called fattening up the trading book. You do lots and lots and lots of trades with lots and lots and lots of leverage. Now here's the thing, it's brilliant, it's all wonderful, right? The only problem is you need some kind of asset in the base there, like the fuel in the car, the gas in the tank, to make the whole thing go. And what was that? Well, from 87 until 2007, American equity markets went up at about 7 or 8% a year. The underlying rate of growth in the American economy is about 3 or 4% a year. This is true in the British economy. It went up by 6 when it was an order of magnitude, different than 2, etc. So what you have is a huge run through equities. The smart money goes, this can't continue. I need a hedge. If you're not investing in equities, what do you invest in? Real estate. So you have a 10-year run up in housing. 2005, 2006, people start to think, this is getting a bit nuts. I don't want to go into equities. I don't want to go into housing. What's the only thing left? Commodities. Do you remember oil going up to $135 for no apparent reason? That was the smart money looking for an out, but those markets were too small and they went pop. So if you basically cycle through equities, the retires are going to go. If, over, if you've overbuilt real estate, you're not going to get that going for another 10 years or so. 
and commodity markets are too small to pump and dump, you don't have any fuel for the machine, which means that the whole business model of investment banking is done, and that's why they're turning it into commercial banks. Uh, I'm Scotty Fleming. I'm a biotech major. Um, I had a question about the comparison between this recession and the, n uh, the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. um, sort of what would you say were the main causes or how do they differ in the, the biggest aspect? And um, does the solution, if it was a solution that we had then, offer some insight into how we can get ourselves out of the mess now? Well, th I hope the solution is not the case because it was called World War II. So I would hope we don't have to have World War III in order to get out of it. We've learned something. Um, here's an interesting way to think about the problem. The, the, basically, the mechanics of it are exactly the same, right? You basically have an enormous asset bubble in the banking sector. It goes bang. This curtails international lending. The global economy is really fragile at this point different from now. Europe's basically living on short-term uh, receipts from the United States. The United States gets spooked after the Wall Street crisis. This is why the German economy contracts. Germany contracts at a time when it's already went through hyperinflation. It has super high unemployment. There's no welfare state. The fascists come to power. It all gets ugly, right? History doesn't repeat itself. So you don't get quite the same outcome, but it's definitely the same trigger. What do we have that's different? We have welfare states. Even the United States is a big welfare state. Think about people who are in the military. After 20 years of service, what do you get? A pension is about 80% of your income. That's like Germany, for goodness sake. And you've got 2 million people under arms. That means that when there's a recession, those people are still spending because the federal taxation pump keeps kicking in. The United States spends 25% of its GDP at the federal level, but it only taxes 18 I hate to tell you this, you're one of the lowest tax societies in the world, and you have horribly irresponsible politicians who tell you otherwise, because that is not sustainable in the long run. If you want it, you've got to pay for it. And we've been living far too long by basically saying, we'll borrow the money from someone else, either from abroad or through pretend assets such as houses. So there's a lot we can do to make ourselves more robust just by better public policy. There's a really simple way to think about this is why it's not the same as this. In 1931, the British economy was nine, the British government spent 9% of GDP. So if they had doubled their expenditure, they still wouldn't have been able to stimulate the economy out of a slump. It's just not big enough. These days, average OECD economy is 35 to 40% of GDP. So even if you cut 5%, you're still spending 36% of the economy. It's still huge. So the cushion we've got is actually much bigger. The problem with it is we've also become much more unequal. So who pays becomes the question. So if you've been making out like a bandit for the past 15 years, earning money in the financial sector, and you've been sensible and banked it, you're fine. doesn't make a difference. But if you're a teacher in Provo who's reliant on a state budget that's in deficit because they didn't raise enough taxes in the first place, that's going to hit them, not the guy who's got the big ski chalet somewhere up in the hills. So there's an inequality here, and that's what the, the bursting of the credit bubble has really revealed that. So we're not in another Great Depression. We're not going to go there. Simply the size of governments, et cetera, means that that's not going to happen. We're going to go through another banking crisis. That could certainly happen. Are things going to be worse before they're better? That might be particularly for the Europeans, but it's different. It's really, really different. The, pol the, the struggle this time is about the going to be about the politics of inequality. So one example of this, you know that Google tool you can do where you can basically track the usage of a word, right? If you go back two years and you look in news articles for the most popular economic term, it's debt. After Occupy start coming out, it becomes inequality. Changes. Okay, my name is Paul Bills. I'm studying English and sociology. And I we're just noticing if it's more unequal, if the people at the top are making more and more, and if it's the banking and not the government, is there anything that private people who own their own money can do or could do to help change this like outside of government, if they could do anything personally because they have so much money and they're making so much more? Uh. Well, it depends whether you'd really want to change it or not. I mean, you know, if, you've, if, you're already, if you already live in, it's Dr. Pangloss, right? So let's use Candide, right? Uh, if it is the best of all possible worlds, why would you want to change it? 
So if you can convince enough people that it's the best of all possible worlds, then you don't change it. And then you've still got a problem, but then you blame something else. I mean, one of the reasons the United States economy, this is a micro example, I'm absolutely convinced of this, is so robust and dynamic. is isn't the level of entrepreneurship, isn't the technological training, because frankly, you're losing that. So I'm glad there's one biotech person here. But nonetheless, it's not those factors. It's the fact that when you're unemployed, you think it's your fault. You get up and move. Europeans don't do that. You're born in Dusseldorf, you die in Dusseldorf. <laughs> you don't go anywhere else. There may be a free movement of capital all over the EU. People, slightly different. It's the talented 10th. And this time, I don't mean African-Americans who made it under uh, the, the repressive regime in the South. I mean the people who are born bilingual. The ones who have got internationally recognized degrees, they're the ones you find in London. Yes, I'm French, but I'm Swiss and I speak seven languages. They're a tiny percentage. Most Europeans don't move. And when they're unemployed, they blame the government. They don't blame themselves. So that makes a huge difference in the way that you can react to economic shocks. So the United States has an inbuilt advantage that way. Now, you, then there's a question of interesting question of justice that comes in here, because you can then say, but is it really your fault? I mean, you know, the banks blow up, and then your firm shut down, and you're unemployed. That's not your fault. That would be the way a European looks at it. An American would turn around and say, well, that might be true, but I'm going to California. And off you go, and you adjust. So another way to think about this, right? When Remember the whole thing about uh, Hurricane Katrina and uh, New Orleans? Right, yes, right. Okay, now in Europe, that was huge. And it was huge for one reason, because we hated Bush, right? So that would just put that down there. So this is anything to beat Bush with, right? This, this reached its nadir when we gave um, uh, Obama a Nobel Peace Prize for just not being Bush. Right? That's pretty much what that was for. It was kind of ridiculous, but true. Right? We were so happy that he wasn't Bush, we gave him a peace prize, even though he hadn't done anything. Right? If we could have given him a faster than light prize, we would have given him that too, just for not being Bush. But anyway, I'm digressing. What the hell was I talking about? Um, Americans being unemployed and uh, uh, I've lost, I hate when that happens. What was it? Oh, Katrina. That was it. Great. Thank you. Right. Uh, basically, by the way, I used to be a stand-up comedian. Anyway, um, so Katrina happens. Now, Katrina happens, you guys are amazing in this one because you have disposable cities, right? I mean, you basically allowed the city to be wiped off the map. You know, Anderson Cooper came down, cried, you know, then everybody forgot about it, right? And basically, you don't do big infrastructure investment. You know, could you imagine if Milan disappeared in an earthquake, right? The entire Italian state would be mobilized. They'd rebuild everything exactly as it was down to the last brick because they have this concept of history and importance. And if Rome fell down, they'd rebuild the Colosseum. New Orleans falls down, we don't care. <laughs> Detroit is literally cannibalizing its housing stock because it is cheaper to destroy it than it is to rebuild it. You are literally wiping a city off the map street by street in Detroit. You don't care. In Los Angeles, there's a thing called the historic district. No one can find it. <laughs> because there's no such thing as history in LA. It's all disposable. That makes you incredibly resilient to shocks. It makes for a society that can be hit, and it just picks up and goes somewhere else. And that is a unique micro-sociological difference that I think really makes a difference and why America responds different to these things than to the Europeans. The European solution to this is typical. Let's have more rules. The American response is, let's break more rules. <laughs> okay, you briefly, oh, I'm Kimberly Austin. I'm a humanities major. Um, you started talking about welfare mm -hmm. and, um, and how we were spending more than we were taxing. Um, what part does welfare play in that? And does taking off more welfare, is that going to affect it in any way? Thank you for asking that question. This is one of my favorites. Right? So I'm going to ask you to figure this out. I'm going to define welfare in the following terms. Actual cash transfers from the federal government to individuals to spend as they like, as a percentage of the federal government's budget. Go. Give me an estimate. What do you think? I mean, we're always, we're so concerned about welfare, we're spending millions, billions of welfare. I mean, come on, what is it as a percentage of the federal government's actual budget? Two. You spend as much on parks and recreation. It's a political myth. 
and talking and defining it very narrowly, right? Cash transfers from the central state to individuals. Now, you do more at the state level. You raise more taxes at the state level. But if it's the big thing about the federal government spending all this money on welfare, Clinton killed it. He signed this bill that basically ended welfare as he knew it, and it really did. It ended it. There is no more free money. It doesn't work like that anymore. The reason you have such a high degree of inequality is you've got so many people working for the minimum wage. That's why you've got the income skew. People work here. You've got an awful lot of people. The labor, uh, the number of people who actually work here has been falling. And you see this in the unemployment figures over time because people aren't coming back into the labor market. But when it was humming along, you have one of the highest labor force participation rates in the world. If you have full employment, who the hell are all the people on welfare? And it's a simple question, right? If 97% of people have jobs, who the hell's claiming all the welfare? It's a myth. It's simply not true. So what do we actually spend our money on? Guess what the biggest item is? Social security. It's pensions. Now, is pensions a form of welfare? That depends on how you define it. Because if you think that it's an entitlement that you've paid into, then that's not welfare. That's a cash transfer back from an investment. All right, so let's take this off. What's the next one? Healthcare. So should we start taking people's health care away? Well, we kind of do because we have a private system, but it's actually hugely public subsidized. So what's after that? It's defense. Now, if you want to take any of those items out, in fact, if you add all of those items together, right, and then cut every other piece of discretionary spending, you will not be able to balance the federal budget. It has nothing to do with welfare. It is a complete myth. Thank you.